models and to understand the business logic. And the business logic in Sweden and the business logic in China or any other country is not the same. They vary. So we need to understand a certain business logic, in this case, Chinese context. Already on the first slide, you can see some very specific things you need to understand when you go to China. And that is that everything you have in written format, business card, business information, has to be in English and in Chinese. Otherwise, you, you have a problem already starting up. Because most of the Chinese business people do not speak English. Young people, yes, but decision makers, for sure, no. And even if they speak English, they don't know how to pronounce and communicate your name with other Chinese. So however you turn around, to have your name, your business in Chinese is one of the basic fundamental things. This is why I have this picture to show you and start <coughs> with. I've been working in China for seven years. And we're working with Chinese companies, and we're working with business model innovation with Chinese Goldwind, Qinfong, ZPMC, and uh, other companies. Also education and training faculties in China. So this is the way I'm learning how to do business in China. I'm not a businessman, I'm a researcher, but I do this kind of business model innovation project to really understand how things are going in China. And only through being working there, I understand. Let me start with showing the picture of this city. If you've never been to Shanghai, please go there. If you ask people the cost for recruiting a middle-level manager in any international companies, they tell you that the price for recruitment is about 500,000 Swedish crowns. That is about 400,000 RMB. You think this is high price? Nothing compared to the cost to make that business man or businesswoman successful in the business. If I ask business people, how long time does it take before they are successful? They tell me years. And this is the number of money they lose for every recruitment. Why? Because that is the loss of income before it takes, before they learn how to do business in China. And that can take four, five, six years. So the cost of not knowing is very high. But most of the Swedish companies I meet, they send people to China. They hire them here, they take them from here, send them to China with only some few days, maybe a week of training, some consultancy company about international culturing. That's it. Almost none of them know about how to do business in China and the difference between Sweden and China. So, when we talk about the business model, the core of a business model is the value proposition. That means what do I offer? If you think about uh, the best phone in the world, this one, the most expensive one, what is the value proposition of iPhone? It's not communication. It's about status. It's about social belonging. It's a lifestyle. That is the value proposition. That has been working in China for years, but not any longer. Now, other brands are taking over the position of top-level brands. So the value proposition is the heart of a business model. And to understand what you're going to offer, you need to understand the customer side. And that is the Chinese customers, which are different than the Swedish customers. They think differently. They have different value systems. They have other norms that we don't understand. And we think we do. And then we go to China, we try to do business the Swedish way, and it does work. So we need to understand the customer uh, point of view. Who are my customers? What do they want? What do they need? What do they expect? What are their experiences? And then, on the other side, how to deliver what they want. So this is basically the simple model of business model. Now, comparing the Western way with the Chinese way, I found some important distinctions. First one is, in the West, we are used to this kind of salami slicing. <laughs> you take a salami and you slice it. Tuck, 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 tuck. And then you optimize pieces. And then you think, now we make the best business through slicing and optimizing. Chinese don't go that way. Chinese think the system way wrong. They are combining things in complementary way. And this is a big difference. Let me give you an illustration. The first time I recovered uh, recover this, uh, realized this, was when my colleague of me, Hobbes, is sitting over there, and me and another colleague, uh, Maya, Hobbes, did a project in the wind power industry. We were comparing Siemens, German Siemens, Chinese Goldwind, with the Indian Susman in Africa. We're thinking, how, who is the most successful? And every time I ask somebody, who do you think is the most successful? Everybody will tell me, Siemens, because it's German. Every time I ask Chinese, who is doing the best business in Africa? They tell me, 
Siemens because they love Western technology and particularly Germans. The true answer is Goldwyn and Sussman. So we were looking closer into that issue. How is it happening? Well, Siemens is selling turbines. Then the African country needs roads. Well, there is another company you need to go to sell you roads. Then you need energy, a third company selling you energy. Then you need grid system, another company selling grid system. Then you need education of young people. Well, go to German universities and so on. So we are slicing all those big issues in slicing. We think that's the best. What are Chinese doing? They put things together in a package, say, you need energy, fine, we have. You need transportation system, fine, we have to with that. At the end of the day, you need financial support, we handle that. And 3,000 young people, we do training for them, for you. We train them. Now you can imagine three, five, ten thousand 10,000 African pe uh, young people being trained in China, going back to Africa. Who do you think they're going to do business with, Europeans or Chinese? Europeans, right? <laughs> no, they are not. They are doing business with Chinese because then they not speak Chinese, they know the Chinese culture, they have relations, they have networks. And this is a kind of system approach. You go to Chinese restaurants, they give you the whole fish on the, on the plate. And we in Sweden don't eat, eat fish with head and tail. But in China they do, that's the only way they eat. And it's wonderful, why? Because they, they don't trust the restaurant to give you the, the fresh fish. They, they want to point on the fish say, I want this one. And they want this one on the plate. They say, oh, this is my fish. You're not fooling me. You're not fooling me. So then they eat the fish and it's tasty. It's wonderful. It's the best fish in the world. And they like head, which we don't eat. We slice it. It's so everything in food, in business, we go the left way. We are slicing. We are optimizing. And Chinese are going the system way. It's a, the first experience. And the most important application in iPhones is WeChat. And more than 800 million people are using WeChat. And what is WeChat? Everything put together. It's Facebook, it's uh, communication, it's payment system. Everything. You can make hotel booking, traveling booking, everything in WeChat. And that is this kind of Chinese system approach, putting things together. And you only need WeChat in China. You have everything you need. You don't need wallet. You don't need Swish SMS payment system. Nothing like that. Everything is connected, integrated in one system package. I have five students being with me too much in China. Do you agree on this? Yes. yes. First thing Chinese do when they meet somebody, do you have WeChat? Can we check yeah. 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 <laughs> my phone. So that is the Chinese way of thinking. Now you think, do you have any better illustration? Yes, I have. I was in Shanghai. They're passing by some years ago when I started, and I saw this sale, 85% of sale of beautiful ladies dressing up the Hennessy Mowers, major man. And I was thinking, my God, they're so beautiful, so sexy. How come they're selling out 85% discount? Why? Isn't, are they not beautiful? Then on Monday morning, I asked some of my friends, she's not here with us. I said, Jasmine, explain to me. Why is this on 85% of discount? Then she looked at me and said, Mike, you don't know much about Chinese ladies, do you? And the answer is, no, I didn't. Now I know. <laughs> but do you want Chinese lady I know would, care, would wear those kind of dresses? Would you, ladies? No. <laughs> this is not the Chinese way of dressing. They don't go this kind of sexy way. They can have short like this, but up here, they are, they are covered. So this is a value system that is very different. But those purchasers sitting in Stockholm, they don't understand the Chinese way of thinking. So they buy the same stuff, sell it in Stockholm, sell it to Shanghai, I think it's the same. It is not, this doesn't work. The Chinese ladies think differently. And the speed of change is so dramatic. The Swedish companies, European companies, cannot catch up with the dynamics of the Chinese buyers. The first thing we do when sun comes out is, ah, give me sun. We want to be tan. We like to be tan. We like to be colorful. The first thing Chinese ladies do in sun is pick up an umbrella. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. Because they don't want to be tan. We sell brun utan soup, brown without sun. Unsellable product in China. Not even one Chinese lady would like to have it. They buy other products that are making them Pale. Because being white, pale, is the most beautiful in China. Very opposite the Swedish way of looking at what is beautiful. So, this is 
this kind of cultural differences that we don't understand. And also, <laughs> professional companies like Blue Air, beautiful products, perfect technology. They're trying to sell the product in China, in Shanghai, one of the shopping malls, exposing the products in the middle of the shopping mall. You don't see even a customer looking at the products. Technology is beautiful. It's a high quality product. But not even one Chinese is looking, standing there, looking at it. Why? Because this is not how you create trust in China. They don't trust you. You sell it like this, they say, fake products, don't look at it. They'd rather pay more money in the shop, because then they trust you. It's inside the shop, it's fancy, it's beautiful, then they trust you. And this kind of sales, we do this in Sweden, it works because we trust them. But in China, this is the most important. Do you trust them? No, you don't trust them. So it doesn't work. And this kind of issue of trust is very, very different than in Sweden. In Sweden, we start by trusting people. In Thailand, they start by not trusting people. You have to earn my trust. Not before you earn my trust, I will do business with you. It's a very different way of thinking. And this leads to new kind of businesses, this kind of label, which means Chinese want to buy original products. They don't trust shops in uh, China. So they buy from foreigners coming from Western countries. And then they want to know that this is original products. So some people, this has become neat business to ensure they're getting original uh, products. So the way of understanding differences is what makes a difference. So, what do we need to understand in China when we try to do business? First, yes, we have this kind of business model, but in the Chinese context, things are different. And one major difference between the Western way of thinking and the Chinese way of thinking is that in the Western way of thinking, the business is running politics. In the Chinese context, it's the other way around. Politics is running business. Which means we need to understand the interrelation between politics, institutions, and regulations, and law. And the development in China is so high, the speed is so high, so the regulation and law is always behind the reality of life and business opportunities. And you also need, in Chinese context, to be very understandable in where is or the winds blowing politically, so that you can understand the linkage between politics and business. And also in the Chinese context, something that is important is corporate social responsibility, not as something marketing, but actually a core of business value proposition. Do you understand where China is going? Well, start by reading the Communist Party annual meeting memorandum when they in three texts indicate what they want to develop, where they want to move, where they want to create environmental issues, pollution issues, this kind of food safety, food security. That is, from the political point of view, a very important issue for the Chinese society to develop. That means companies wanted to do business in China. If they tell Chinese, I want to do business in China, they will tell you, okay, I want to do business in China, but I also want to develop the Chinese society to help with the pollution issue. Ah, you are very welcome. So you need to interact with this kind of direction of the Chinese society development, where China is moving, to find this kind of linkage. And we call it symbiotic relation between politics and business. Now you say, this is typical Chinese. No, it's not. Because this is how Sweden developed industry in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. During this time of period, Chinese business was very highly interrelated with the Swedish politics. When Ericsson developed the new Axia telephone communication system in the 70s, it was a decision between Ericsson and Wallenberg family and politics to go this way. So this is the way we have been running our operations for years. Then we came to the 80s and 90s where we separated business from politics. Then we think there were markets, market forces running operations. Still, we have a lot of connections, but we don't talk about it in the Western. We are extremely good in pretending that don't exist, that there is a separation between politics and business. But it is there. 
But in the Chinese context, it's not more open that this is important to understand for the development of this. And because of that, ethics is important in the Chinese context. For example, many years ago, you could uh, see many companies in China renting bikes, yellow, blue, and other colors. Renting bikes. They make big money on fee for putting yourself to register yourself as the user, very little money for renting the bikes. This business model is now becoming unethical. Why? Because they are squeezing people, putting more money in you, uh, you uh, register as user, and then we don't care about giving you services. Now the Chinese government is saying, we don't like this kind of business. Well, it's unethical. Even the Chinese government is saying, no, please, we don't want this. Change, move away. So, Ethics and corporate social responsibility are core components in a business model if you want to make successful business in the Chinese context. While in the Western, this can be to a large extent a marketing issue. And